The Judicial Murder of Mary E. Surratt by David Miller DeWitt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Preface Oceans of horsehair, continents of parchment, and learned sergeant eloquence, were it continued till the learned tongue wore itself small in the indefatigable learned mouth, cannot make the unjust just. The grand question still remains. Was the judgment just? If unjust, it will not and cannot get harbor for itself or continue to have footing in this universe, which was made by other than one unjust. Enforce it by never such statuting, three readings, royal assents, blow it to the four winds with all manner of quilted trumpeters and pursuivants, in the rear of them never so many gibbets and hangmen, it will not stand, it cannot stand. From all souls of men, from all ends of nature, from the throne of God above, there are voices bidding it, away, away. Past and Present End of Preface The Judicial Murder of Mary E. Surratt by David Miller DeWitt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Preliminary Chapter 1 The Reign of Terror. The assassination of Abraham Lincoln burst upon the city of Washington like a black thunderbolt out of a cloudless sky. On Monday, the 3rd of April, 1865, Richmond was taken. On the succeeding Sunday, the ninth, General Lee, with the main army of the South, surrendered. The rebellion of nearly one-half the nation lay in its death throes. The desperate struggle for the unity of the Republic was ending in a perfect triumph, and the loyal people gave full rein to their joy. Every night the streets of the city were illuminated. The chief officers of the government, one after another, were serenaded, on the evening of Tuesday, the 11th, the President addressed his congratulations to an enthusiastic multitude from a window of the White House. On the night of Thursday, the 13th, Edwin M. Stanton, the Secretary of War, and Ulysses S. Grant, the victorious General of the Army of the North, were tumultuously greeted with banners and music and cannon at the residency of the Secretary. The next day, Friday, the 14th, was the fourth anniversary of the surrender of Fort Sumter to the South, and that national humiliation was to be avenged by the restoration of the flag of the United States to its proper place above the fort by the hand of the same gallant officer who had been compelled to pull it down. In the evening a torchlight procession perambulated the streets of the Federal Capitol. Enthusiastic throngs filled the theaters, where the presence of great officials had been advertised by huge placards, and whose walls were everywhere festooned with the American flag. After four years of agonizing but unabating strain, all patriots felt justified in yielding to the full enjoyment of the glorious relaxation. Suddenly, at its very zenith, the snap of a pistol dislimbs and scatters the great jubilee, as though it were indeed the insubstantial fabric of a vision, at half-past ten that night, from the box of the theatre where the President is seated, a shot is heard. A wild figure, hatless and clutching a gleaming knife, emerges through the smoke. It leaps from the box to the stage, falls upon one knee, recovers itself, utters one shout, and waves aloft its bloody weapon. Then turns, limps across in front of the audience, and disappears like a phantom behind the scenes. Simultaneously there breaks upon the startled air the shriek of a woman, followed close by confused cries of water, water, and the president is shot. For the first few moments both audience and actors are paralyzed. One man alone jumps from the auditorium to the stage and pursues the flying apparition, but as soon as the hopeless condition of the president and the escape of the assassin begin to transpire, angry murmurs of, "'Burn the theater!' are heard in the house, and soon swell into a roar in the street where a huge crowd is already assembled. The intermingling throng surges into the building from every quarter and mounts guard at every exit. Not one of the company of actors is allowed to go out. The people seem to pause for a moment, 
as if awaiting from heaven a retribution as sudden and awful as the crime. All their joy is turned to grief in the twinkling of an eye. The rebellion they had too easily believed to be dead could still strike, it seemed, a fatal blow against the very life of the Republic. A panic seizes the multitude in and around the theatre, and from the theatre spreads, like the night, over the whole city. And when the frightened citizens hear, as they immediately do, the story of the bloody massacre in the house of the Secretary of State, occurring at the same hour with the murder of the President, the panic swells into a reign of terror. The wildest stories find the quickest and most eager credence. Every member of the Cabinet and the General of the Army have been or are about to be killed. The government itself is at a standstill, and the lately discomfited rebels are soon to be in possession of the capital. Patriotic people, delivering themselves over to a fear of they know not what, cry hoarsely for vengeance on they know not whom. The citizen, upon whose past loyalty the slightest suspicion can be cast, cowers for safety close to his hearthstone. The terror-stricken multitude want but a leader cool and unscrupulous enough to plunge into a promiscuous slaughter such as stained the newborn revolution in France. A leader, indeed, they soon find, but he is not a Danton. He is a leader only in the sense that he has caught the same madness of terror and suspicion which has seized the people, and that he holds high place, and that he has the power and is in fit humor to pander to the panic. Edwin M. Stanton was forced by the tremendous crisis up to the very top of affairs. Vice President Johnson, in the harrowing novelty of his position, was for the time being awed into passive docility. The Secretary of State was doubly disabled if not killed. The General of the Army was absent. The Secretary of War, without hesitation, grasped the helm thus thrust into his hand. But, alas, he immediately lost his head. His exasperation at the irony of fate, which could so ruthlessly and in a moment wither the triumph of a great cause by so unexpected and overwhelming a calamity, was so profound and intense, his desire for immediate and commensurate vengeance was so uncontrollable and unreasoning as to distort his perception, unsettle his judgment, and thus cause him to form an estimate of the nature and extent of the impending danger as false and exaggerated as that of the most panic-stricken wretch in the streets. Personally, besides, he was unfitted in many respects for such an emergency. Though an able, and it may be a great war minister, he exerted no control over his temper, he habitually identified a conciliatory and charitable disposition with active disloyalty, and being unpopular with the people of Washington by reason of the gruffness of his ways and the inconsistencies of his past political career, he had reached the unalterable conviction that the capital was a nest of sympathizers with the South, and that he was surrounded by enemies of himself and his country. When, therefore, upon the crushing news that the President was slain, followed hard the announcement that another assassin had made a slaughterhouse of the residence of the minister's own colleague, self-possession, the one supreme quality which was indispensable to a leader at such an awful juncture, forsook him and fled. Before the breath was out of the body of the President, the Secretary had rushed to the conclusion, unsupported as yet by a shadow of testimony, that the acts of Booth and of the assailant of Seward, at the moment supposed to be John H. Surratt, were the outcome of a widespread, numerous, and powerful conspiracy to kill not only the President and the Secretary of State, but all the other heads of the departments, the Vice President, and the General of the Army as well, and thus bring the government to an end, and that the primary moving power of the conspiracy was the defunct rebellion as represented by its titular President and his Cabinet and its agents in Canada. This belief, embraced with so much precipitation, immediately became more than a belief. It became a fixed idea in his mind. He saw, heard, felt, and cherished everything that favored it. He would see nothing, would hear nothing, and hated everything that in the slightest degree militated against it. Upon this theory he began, and upon this theory he prosecuted to the end, every effort for the discovery, arrest, trial, and punishment of the murderers. He was seconded by a lieutenant well fitted for such a purpose, General Lafayette C. 
Baker, chief of the detective force. In one of the two minority reports presented at the House of Representatives by the Judiciary Committee on the Impeachment Investigation of 1867, this man and his methods are thus delineated. The first witness examined was General Lafayette C. Baker, late chief of the detective police, and although examined on oath, time and again, and on various occasions, it is doubtful whether he has in any one thing told the truth, even by accident. In every important statement he is contradicted by witnesses of unquestioned credibility. And there can be no doubt that to his many previous outrages entitling him to an unenviable immortality, he has added that of willful and deliberate perjury, and we are glad to know that no one member of the committee deems any statement made by him as worthy of the slightest credit. What a blush of shame will tinge the cheek of the American student in future ages when he reads that this miserable wretch for years held, as it were, in the hollow of his hand the liberties of the American people, that clothed with power by a reckless administration, and with his hordes of unprincipled tools and spies permeating the land everywhere, with uncounted thousands of the people's money placed in his hands for his vile purposes, this creature not only had power to arrest without crime or writ, and imprison without limit any citizen of the Republic, but that he actually did so arrest thousands all over the land, and filled the prisons of the country with the victims of his malice or that of his masters. In this man's hands, Secretary Stanton placed all the resources of the War Department, in soldiers, detectives, material, and money, and commanded him to push ahead and apprehend all persons suspected of complicity in the assumed conspiracy, and to conduct an investigation as to the origin and purpose of the crime, upon the theory he had adopted, and which, as much as any other, Baker was perfectly willing to accept and then, by his peculiar methods, establish. Forthwith was ushered in the grand carnival of detectives. Far and wide they sped. They had orders from Baker to do two things. One, to arrest all the suspect. Two, by promises, rewards, threats, deceit, force, or any other effectual means, to extort confessions and procure testimony to establish the conspiracy whose existence had been postulated. At two o'clock in the morning of Saturday the 15th, they burst into the house of Mrs. Surratt, and displaying the bloody collar of the coat of the dying Lincoln, demanded the whereabouts of Booth and Surratt. It being presently discovered that Booth had escaped on horseback across the Navy Yard Bridge with Davy Harrell ten minutes in his rear, a dash was made upon the livery stables of Washington, their proprietors taken into custody, and then the whole of Lower Maryland was invaded, the soldiers declaring martial law as they progressed. Ford's theater was taken and held by an armed force, and the proprietor and employees were all swept into prison, including Edward Spangler, a scene-shifter, who had been a menial attendant of Booth's. The superstitious notion prevailed that the inanimate edifice whose walls had suffered such a desecration was in some vague sense an accomplice. The secretary swore that no dramatic performance should ever take place there again, and the suspicion was sedulously kept alive that the manager and the whole force of the company must have aided their favorite actor, or the crime could not have been so easily perpetrated, and the assassin escaped. On the night of the 15th, Saturday, a locked room in the Kirkwood house where Vice President Johnson was stopping, which had been engaged by George A. Atzerott, on the morning of the 14th, was broken open, and in the bed were found a bowie knife and a revolver, and on the wall a coat, subsequently identified as Herald's, in which was found, among other articles, a bank book of Booth's. The room had not been otherwise occupied, Atzerodt, after taking possession of it, having mysteriously disappeared. On the morning of the 17th, Monday, at Baltimore, Michael O'Laughlin was arrested as a friend of Booth's, and it was soon thought that he resembled extremely a certain suspicious stranger, who it was remembered had been seen prowling about Secretary Stanton's residence on the night of the 13th, when the serenade took place, and there doing such an unusual act as inquiring for, and looking at, General Grant. On the same day at Fort Monroe, Samuel Arnold was arrested, whose letter, signed Sam, had been found on Saturday night among the effects of Booth. 
On the night of the 17th, also, the house of Mrs. Surratt, with all its contents, was taken possession of by the soldiers, and Mrs. Surratt, her daughter, and all the other inmates were taken into custody. While the ladies were making preparations for their departure to prison, a man disguised as a laborer, with a sleeve of his knit undershirt drawn over his head, a pickaxe on his shoulder and covered with mud, came to the door with the story that he was to dig a drain for Mrs. Surratt in the morning, and that lady asseverating that she had never seen the man before, he was swept with the rest to headquarters, and there, to the astonishment of everybody, turned out to be the desperate assailant of the Sewards. During these few days Washington was like a city of the dead. The streets were hung with crepe. The obsequies, which started on its march across the continent the colossal funeral procession in which the whole people were mourners, were being celebrated with the most solemn pomp. No business was done except at military headquarters. Men hardly dared talk of the calamity of the nation. Everywhere soldiers and police were on the alert to seize any supposed or denounced sympathizer with the South. Mysterious and prophetic papers turned up at the White House and the War Department. Women whispered terrible stories of what they knew about the great crime. To be able to give evidence was to be envied as a hero. And still the arch-devil of the plot could not be found. The lower parts of Maryland seethed like a boiling pot, and the prisons of Washington were choking with the suspect from that quarter. Lloyd the drunken landlord of the tavern at Surrattsville, ten miles from Washington, at which Booth and Harold had stopped at midnight on the fatal Friday for carbines and whiskey, after two days of stubborn denial was at first frightened into confession, and Dr. Mudd, who had set Booth's legs Saturday morning thirty miles from Washington, was in close confinement. All the intimate friends of the actor in Washington, in Baltimore, in Philadelphia, in New York, and even in Montreal, were in the clutches of the government. Surratt himself, the pursuit of whom, guided by Weichmann, his former college chum, his roommate, and the favorite guest of his mother, had been instant and thorough. It was ascertained, had left Canada on the 12th of April, and was back again on the 18th. But where was Booth? Where Harold? Where Atzerott? On the 20th, the Secretary of War applied the proper stimulus by issuing a proclamation to the following effect. Fifty thousand dollars reward will be paid by this department for the apprehension of the murderer of our late beloved President. Twenty-five thousand dollars reward for the apprehension of John H. Surratt, one of Booth's accomplices. Twenty-five thousand dollars reward for the apprehension of Harold, another of Booth's accomplices. Liberal rewards will be paid for any information that shall conduce to the arrest of either of the above-named criminals or their accomplices. All persons harboring or secreting the said persons, or either of them, or aiding or assisting in their concealment or escape, will be treated as accomplices in the murder of the President and the attempted assassination of the Secretary of State, and shall be subject to trial before a military commission and the punishment of death. What is noteworthy about this document is that Stanton had already made up his mind as to the guilt of the persons named as accomplices of Booth, that he needed only their arrest, being assured of their consequent conviction, and that he had already determined that their trial and the trial of all persons connected with the great crime, however remotely, should be had before a military tribunal, and that the punishment to follow conviction should be death. At four o'clock in the morning of the very day this proclamation was issued, Atzerodt was apprehended at the house of his cousin in Montgomery County, Maryland, about twenty-two miles northward of Washington, by a detail of soldiers, to whom, by the way, notwithstanding the arrest preceded the proclamation, twenty-five thousand dollars reward was subsequently paid. With Atzerodt, his cousin, Richter, was taken also. O'Laughlin, Payne, Arnold, Atzerodt, and Richter, as they were severally arrested, were put into the custody of the Navy Department, and confined aboard the Monitor Sulgus, which on the morning of Saturday, when the President died, had been ordered to swing out into the middle of the river opposite the Navy Yard, prepared to receive at any hour, day or night, dead or alive, the arch-assassin. 
Each of these prisoners was loaded with double irons and kept under a strong guard. On the 23rd, Atzerott, by order of the Secretary of War, was transferred to the monitor Montauk to separate him from his cousin, and Payne, in addition to his double irons, had a ball and chain fastened to each ankle by the direction of the same officer. On the next day Spangler, who had hitherto been confined in the old capital prison, was transferred to one of the monitors, and presumably subjected to the same treatment. On the same day the following order was issued. The Secretary of War requests that the prisoners on board ironclads belonging to this department for better security against conversation shall have a canvas bag put over the head of each and tied around the neck, with a hole for proper breathing and eating, but not seeing, and that pain be secured to prevent self-destruction, all of which was accordingly done. And still no booth. It seems as though the secretary were mad enough to imagine that he could wring from Providence the arrest of the principal assassin by heaping tortures on his supposed accomplices. At length, on the afternoon of the 26th, Wednesday, the second week after the assassination, Colonel Conger arrived with the news of the death of Booth and the capture of Harold on the early morning of that day, bringing with him the diary and other articles found on the person of Booth, which were delivered to Secretary Stanton at his private residence. In the dead of the ensuing night, the body of Booth, sewed up in an old army blanket, arrived, attended by the dog-like Herald, and the living and the dead were immediately transferred to the Montauk. Herald was double iron, balled and chained and hooded. The body of Booth was identified, an autopsy hill, the shattered bone of his neck taken out for preservation as a relic, it now hangs from the ceiling of the medical museum into which Ford's theatre was converted, or did before the collapse. And then, with the utmost secrecy and with all the mystery which could be fabricated, under the direction of Colonel Baker, the corpse was hurriedly taken from the vessel into a small boat, rowed to the arsenal grounds, and buried in a grave dug in a large cellar-like apartment on the ground floor of the old penitentiary. The door was locked the key removed and delivered into the hands of Secretary Stanton. No effort was spared to conceal the time, place, and circumstances of the burial. False stories were set afloat by Baker in furtherance of such purpose. Stanton seemed to fear an escape or rescue of the dead man's body, and vowed that no rebel or no rebel sympathizer should have a chance to glory over the corpse, or a fragment of the corpse, of the murderer of Lincoln. End of chapter 1「The Judicial Murder of Mary E. Surratt » by David Miller DeWitt This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Preliminary Chapter 2 The Bureau of Military Injustice Mingled with the varied emotions evoked by the capture and death of the chief criminal was a feeling of deepest exasperation that the foul assassin should after all have eluded the ignominious penalty of his crime. Then arose a savage disposition on the part of the governing powers to wreak this baffled vengeance first on his inanimate body, second on the lives of his associates held so securely in such close custody and thirdly, on all those in high places who might be presumed to sympathize with his deeds. It was too horrible to imagine that the ghost of the martyred Lincoln should walk unavenged. So stupendous a calamity must of necessity be the outcome of as stupendous a conspiracy, and must in the very justice of things be followed by as stupendous a retribution. A sacrifice must be offered, and the victims must be forthcoming to employ the parallel subsequently drawn by General Ewing on the trial of the conspirators. On the funeral pyre of Patroclus must be immolated the twelve Trojan captives. They were sure of Payne and of Herald. They held Arnold and O'Laughlin and Atzerodt and Spangler and Dr. Mudd, all the supposed satellites of Booth, save one. John H. Surratt could not be found. Officers in company with Weichman and Holohan, the boarders at his mother's house, who in the terror of the moment had given themselves up on the morning of the 15th, traced him to Canada, as has already been noticed, but had there lost track of him. 
They had returned disappointed, and now Wakeman and Holohan were in solitary confinement. Notwithstanding the large rewards out for his capture, as to him alone the all-powerful government seemed to be baffled. One consolation there was, however. If they could not find the son, they held the mother as a hostage for him, and they clung to the cruel expectation that by putting her to the torture of a trial and a sentence they might force the son from his hiding-place. In the meanwhile, the Bureau of Military Justice, presided over by Judge Advocate General Holt, had been unceasingly at work. General Baker, with his posse of soldiers and detectives, scoured the country far and wide for suspected persons and witnesses, hauled them to Washington, and shut them up in the prisons. Then the Bureau of Military Justice took them in hand, and when necessary, by promises, hopes of reward, and threats of punishment, squeezed out of them the testimony they wanted. Colonel Henry L. Burnett, who had become an expert in such proceedings from having recently conducted the trial of Milligan before a military tribunal at Indianapolis, was brought on to help Judge Holt in the great and good work. In the words of General Ewing, in his plea for Dr. Mudd, the very frenzy of madness ruled the hour. Reason was swallowed up in patriotic passion, and a feverish and intense excitement prevailed, most unfavorable, to a calm, correct hearing and faithful repetition of what was said, especially by the suspected. Again and again and again the accused were catechized by detectives, each of whom was vying with the other as to which should make the most important discoveries, and each making the examination with a preconceived opinion of guilt, and with an eager desire, if not determination, to find in what might be said the proofs of guilt. Again the witnesses testified under the strong stimulus of a promised reward for information leading to arrest and followed by convictions. The Bureau conducted the investigation on the preconceived theory, adopted, as we have seen, by the Secretary of War, that the Confederate government was the source of the conspiracy, and by lavishing promises and rewards it had no difficulty in finding witnesses who professed themselves to have been spies on the rebel agents in Canada, and who were ready to implicate them and through them the president of the defunct Confederacy in the assassination. Richard Montgomery and Sanford Conover, who had been in personal communication with these agents during the past year, were eagerly taken into the employ of the Bureau, and made frequent trips to Canada, to return every time laden with fresh proofs of the complicity of the rebels. To illustrate how the Bureau of Military Justice dealt with witnesses who happened to have been connected more or less closely with Booth, and who were either truculent or unable to make satisfactory disclosures, here are two extracts from the evidence given on the trial of John H. Surratt in 1867. The first is from the testimony of Lloyd, the besotted keeper of the Surratt Tavern. I was first examined at Bryantown by Colonel Wells. I was next examined by two different persons at the Carroll prison. I did not know either of their names. One was a military officer. I think some of the prisoners described him as Colonel Foster. I saw a man at the conspiracy trial as one of the judges who looked very much like him. I told him I had made a fuller statement to Colonel Wells than I could possibly do to him under the circumstances while things were fresh in my memory. His reply was that it was not full enough, and then commenced questioning me whether I had ever heard any person say that something wonderful or something terrible was going to take place. I told him I had never heard anyone say so. Said he, I have seen it in the newspapers. He jumps up very quick off his seat, as if very mad, and asked me if I knew what I was guilty of. I told him, under the circumstances, I did not. He said, you are guilty as an accessory to a crime, the punishment of which is death. With that, I went upstairs to my room. The next is from the testimony of Louis J. Carland, to whom Weichman confessed his remorse after the execution of Mrs. Surratt. He, Weichman, said it would have been very different with Mrs. Surratt if he had been let alone, that a statement had been prepared for him, that it was written out for him, and that he was threatened with prosecution as one of the conspirators if he did not swear to it. He said that a detective had been put into Carroll prison with him, and that this man had written out a statement which he said he had made in his sleep, and that he had to swear to that statement. 
Let us add another. It is so short and yet so suggestive. It is from the testimony of James J. Gifford, who was a witness for the prosecution on both trials. Question. Do you know Mr. Weichman? Answer. I have seen him. Question. Were you in Carroll Prison with him? Answer. Yes, sir. Question. Did he say in your presence that an officer of the government had told him that unless he testified to more than he had already stated, they would hang him too? Answer. I heard the officer tell him so. After a fortnight of such wholesale processes of arrest, imprisonment, inquisition, reward, and intimidation, the Bureau of Military Justice announced itself ready to prove the charges it had formulated. Thereupon two proclamations were issued by President Johnson. One, dated May the 1st, after stating that the Attorney General had given his opinion, quote, that all persons implicated in the murder of the late President Abraham Lincoln and the attempted assassination of the Honorable William H. Seward, Secretary of State, and in an alleged conspiracy to assassinate other officers of the federal government at Washington City, and their aiders and abettors, are subject to the jurisdiction of and legally triable before a military commission, end quote. Ordered first, quote, that the Assistant Adjutant General, W. A. Nichols, detail nine competent military officers to serve as a commission for the trial of said parties, and that the Judge Advocate General proceed to prefer charges against said parties for their alleged offenses, and bring them to trial before said military commission, unquote. Second, quote, that Brevet Major General Hartranft be assigned to duty as Special Provost Marshal General for the purpose of said trial and attendance upon said commission and the execution of its mandates, unquote. The other proclamation, dated May 2nd, after reciting that, quote, it appears from evidence in the Bureau of Military Justice that the atrocious murder of the late President Abraham Lincoln and the attempted assassination of the Honorable William H. Seward, Secretary of State, were incited, concerted, and procured by and between Jefferson Davis, late of Richmond, Virginia, and Jacob Thompson, Clement C. Clay, Beverly Tucker, George N. Sanders, William C. Cleary, and other rebels and traitors against the government of the United States harbored in Canada, end quote, offered the following rewards. $100,000 for the arrest of Jefferson Davis, $25,000 for the arrest of Clement C. Clay, $25,000 for the arrest of Jacob Thompson, late of Mississippi, $25,000 for the arrest of George N. Saunders, $25,000 for the arrest of Beverly Tucker, $10,000 for the arrest of William C. Cleary, late clerk of Clement C. Clay. The Provost Marshal General of the United States is directed to cause a description of said persons with notice of the above rewards to be published. At this date, the President of the defunct Confederacy was a fugitive without an army, and bands of U.S. cavalry were already on the scout to intercept his flight. Military justice, however, was too impatient to await the arrest of the prime object of its sword, and in obedience to the first proclamation proceeded without delay to organize a court to try the prisoners selected from the multitude undergoing confinement as the fittest victims to appease the shade of the murdered president. Over some of the suspect, the judge advocates for a time vacillated, whether to include them in the indictment or to use them as witnesses but after a season of rigid examinations renewed and revised, they at last concluded that such persons would be more available in the latter capacity. On the third day of May, the funeral car, which, leaving Washington on the 21st of April, had borne the body of the lamented Lincoln through state after state, arrived at last at Springfield, and on the following day the cherished remains were there consigned to the tomb. On the 6th, by special order of the Adjutant General, a military commission was appointed to meet at Washington on Monday the 8th of May, or as soon thereafter as practicable, quote, for the trial of David E. Herald, George A. Atzerodt, Louis Payne, Michael O. Laughlin, Edward Spangler, Samuel Arnold, Mary E. Surratt, Samuel A. Mudd, and such other prisoners as may be brought before it, implicated in the murder of the late president and in the attempted assassination of the secretary of state and in an alleged conspiracy to assassinate other officers of the federal government at washington city and their aiders and abettors 
by order of the President of the United States. End quote. And so, all things being in readiness, let the curtain rise. End of chapter 2「The Judicial Murder of Mary E. Surratt » by David Miller DeWitt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Part 1. The Murder. Chapter 1. The Opening of the Court. On the ninth day of May the Commission met, but only to adjourn that the prisoners might employ counsel. On the same day two of its members, General Cyrus B. Comstock and Colonel Horace Porter, names to be noted for what may have been a heroic refusal, were relieved from the duty of sitting upon the commission, and two other officers substituted in their stead. So that Tuesday, May 10th, 1865, twenty-six days after the assassination, a period much too short for the intense excitement and wild desire for vengeance to subside, may properly be designated as the first session of the court. On the early morning of that day, before daylight, Jefferson Davis had been captured, and was immediately conducted not to Washington to stand trial for his alleged complicity in the assassination, but to Fort Monroe. On the next day Clement C. Clay also surrendered himself to the United States authorities, and was sent not to Washington to meet the awful charge formulated against him, but to the same military fortress. The room in which the commission met was in the northeast corner of the third story of the old penitentiary, a building standing in the U.S. arsenal grounds at the junction of the Potomac with the eastern branch, in a room on the ground floor of which the body of Booth had been secretly buried. Its windows were guarded by iron gratings, and it communicated with that part of the prison where the accused were now confined, by a door in the western wall. The male prisoners had been removed some days before from the monitors to the penitentiary, where Mrs. Surratt was already incarcerated, and each of them, including the lady, was now immured in a solitary cell under the surveillance of a special guard. Around a table near the eastern side of this room sat, resplendent in full uniform, the members of the court. At the head as president was Major General David Hunter a stern white-headed soldier, sixty-three years old, a fierce radical, the first officer to organize the slaves into battalions of war, the warm personal friend of Lincoln, at the head of whose corpse he had grimly sat as it rested from place to place on the triumphal progress to its burial, and from whose open grave he had hurried, in no very judicial humor, to say the least, to take his seat among the judges of the accused assassins. On his right sat Major General Lew Wallace, a lawyer by profession, afterwards the president of the court-martial which tried and hung Henry Wirtz. But now, by a sardonic freak of destiny, known to all the world as the tender teller of Ben-Hur, a tale of the Christ. To the right of General Wallace sat Brevet Brigadier General James A. Eakin and Brevet Colonel Charles A. Tompkins about whom the only thing remarkable is that they had stepped into the places of the two relieved officers, Colonel Tompkins being the only regular army officer on the board. On the left of General Hunter sat, first, Brevet Major General August V. Kautz, a native of Germany, next, Brigadier General Robert S. Foster, who may or may not have been the Colonel Foster, alluded to in the testimony of Lloyd, quoted above, as threatening the witness and as afterwards being seen by him on the commission. The presence of an officer, previously engaged by the government in collecting testimony against the accused, as one of the judges to try him, not being considered a violation of military justice. Next sat Brigadier General Thomas Mealy Harris, a West Virginian and the author of a book entitled Calvinism Vindicated. Next, Brigadier General Albion P. Howe, and last, Lieutenant Colonel David R. Clendenin. Not one of these nine men could have withstood the challenge which the common law mercifully puts into the hands of the most abandoned culprit. They had come together with one determined and unchangeable purpose, to avenge the foul murder of their beloved commander-in-chief. They dreamt not of acquittal. They were, necessarily, from the very nature of their task, organized to convict. 
The accused were asked, it is true, whether they had any objections to any member of the court. But this was the emptiest of forms, as bias is no cause of challenge in military procedure, and peremptory challenges are unknown. Moreover, it was nothing but a cruel mockery to offer to that trembling group of prisoners an opportunity which, if any one of them had the temerity to embrace, could only have resulted in barbing with the sting of personal insult the hostile predisposition of the judges. At the foot of the table around which the court sat, the table standing parallel with the north side of the room, there was another around which were gathered the three prosecuting officers, who, according to military procedure, were also members of the commission. First was Brigadier General Joseph Holt, the judge advocate of the U.S. Army, and the recorder of the commission. During his past military career he had distinguished himself on many a bloody court-martial. Second, designated by General Holt as first assistant or special judge advocate, was Honorable John A. Bingham of Ohio, long a representative in Congress, then for a short interval a military judge advocate, now a representative in Congress again, and to become in the strange vicissitudes of the near future one of the managers of the impeachment of President Johnson, whom he now cannot praise too highly. He was one of those fierce and fiery western criminal lawyers, gifted with that sort of vociferous oratory which tells upon jurors and on the stump, by nature and training able to see but one side to a case, and consequently merciless to his victims. His special function was to cross-examine and browbeat the witnesses for the defense, a branch of his profession in which he was proudly proficient, and above all by pathetic appeals to their patriotism and loyalty, and by measureless denunciations of the murder of their commander-in-chief and of the rebellion to keep up at white heat the already burning passions of the officers composing the tribunal. Next to him came Colonel Henry L. Burnett, brought from Indiana, where he had won recent laurels in conducting the trial of Milligan for treason before a military commission, laurels, alas, soon to be blasted by the decision of the U.S. Supreme Court, pronouncing that and all other military commissions for the trial of citizens in places where the civil courts are open illegal, and setting free the man this zealous public servant had been instrumental in condemning to death. In the center of the room was a witness stand facing the court. To the left of the witness stand a table for the official reporters. Along the western side and directly opposite the court was a platform about a foot high and four feet broad, with a strong railing in front of it. This was the prisoner's dock. The platform was divided near the left-hand or southern corner by the doorway which led to the cells. In front of the southern end of the dock and behind the witness stand was the table of the prisoner's counsel. At the appointed hour the door in the western side opens, and an impressive and mournful procession appears. Six soldiers, armed to the teeth, are interspersed among seven male prisoners and one woman. First walks Samuel Arnold, the young Baltimorean, who is to sit at the extreme right, i.e., of the spectators, followed close by his armed guard. Next, Dr. Samuel T. Mudd and a soldier. Next, Edward Spangler and a soldier. Next, Michael O'Laughlin, another Baltimorean, and his soldier. Next, George B. Atzerodt and a soldier. Next, Louis Payne, a tall gladiator, though only twenty years old, and his soldier and then David E. Harold, looking like an insignificant boy, who is to sit next the door. As they enter, their fetters clanking at every step, they turn to their left and take seats on the platform in the order named, the six soldiers being sandwiched here and there between two of the men. Each of the prisoners during the entire trial was loaded down with irons made as massive and uncomfortable as possible. Their wrists were bound with the heaviest handcuffs connected by bars of iron ten inches long, with the exception of Dr. Mudd, whose handcuffs were connected by a chain, so that they could not join their hands. Their legs were weighed down by shackles, joined by chains made short enough to hamper their walk. In addition to these fetters, common to all, Payne and Adzerot had attached by the chains to their legs huge iron balls, which their guards had to lift and carry after them whenever they entered or left the courtroom. 
last there emerges from the dungeon-like darkness of the doorway the single female prisoner mary e surratt she alone turns to her right and consequently when she is seated has the left-hand corner of the platform to herself but she is separated from her companions in misery by more than the narrow passageway that divides the dock for she is a lady of fair social position of unblemished character and of exemplary piety and besides she is a mother a widow and in that room amongst all those soldiers lawyers guards judges and prisoners the sole representative of her sex her womanhood is her peculiar weakness yet still her only shield is she too ironed the unanimous testimony of eyewitnesses published at the time of the trial is that though not handcuffed she was bound with iron anklets on her feet and this detail thus universally proclaimed in the northern press and by loyal writers was mentioned not as conveying the slightest hint of reprobation but as constituting like the case of the male prisoners a part of the appropriate treatment by the military of a person suffering under such a charge and moreover no contemporaneous denial of this widespread circumstance was anywhere made either by provost marshal counsel judge advocate or member of the court it passed unchallenged into history like many another deed of shame over which it is a wonder that any man could glory but which characterized that period of frenzy eight years after during the bitter controversy between andrew johnson and joseph holt over the recommendation of mercy to mrs surratt general hartranft the former special provost marshal in charge of the prisoners first broke silence and coming to the aid of the sorely tried ex-judge advocate sent him a vehement categorical denial that mrs surratt was ever manacled at any time or that there was ever a thought of manacling her in any one's mind now what force should be given to such a denial by so distinguished an officer so long delayed and in the face of such universal contemporaneous affirmation no one knows how close and exclusive the charge of the prisoners by the special provost marshal was nor how liable to interpretation interference and suppression by the omnipotent bureau of military justice or by the maddened secretary of war and his obsequious henchmen at the time the naked assertion was made to heap indignities upon the head of the only woman in the whole country whom the soldiery took for granted was the one female fiend who helped to shed the blood of the martyred president was so consonant with the angry feeling in military circles that an officer having only a general superintendence over the custody and treatment of what was called a band of fiends should be very likely to overlook such a small matter as that the she assassin was not exempted in one detail from the contumelies and cruelties it was thought patriotic to pile upon her co-conspirators the only wonder ought to be that they relieved her from the handcuffs they appeared to have discriminated in the case of dr mudd also substituting a chain for an inflexible bar so that he for one could move his hands there may have been some unmentioned physical reasons for both of these alleviations but we may rest assured that neither sex in the one case nor profession in the other was among them general hartranft or any other general never denied or thought it necessary to deny that the seven male prisoners sat through the seven weeks of the trial loaded nay tortured with irons and there is no doubt that this unspeakable outrage if thought of at all at the trial by the soldiery high or low so far from being thought of as a matter of reprobation was a subject of grim merriment or stern congratulation eight years however passed away eight years in which a fund of indignation at such brutality above all to a woman had been silently accumulating until at length to a soldier whose beclouded passions of the moment had in the meantime cooled down its weight made every loophole of escape and entrance for the very breath of life the entire atmosphere had changed and denials became the order of the day memory is a most convenient faculty and to forget what the lapse of years has at last stamped with infamy is easy when the event passed at the time as a mere matter of course leaving these tardy repudiators of an iniquity the responsibility for which in the day of its first publication they tacitly assumed with the utmost complacency to settle the question with posterity 
We insist that the preference is open to writers upon the events of the year 1865 to rely upon the unprejudiced and unchallenged statement of eyewitnesses, and therefore we do here reaffirm that Mary E. Surratt walked into the courtroom and sat during her trial with shackles upon her limbs. At this late date it is a most natural supposition that these nine stalwart military heroes, sitting comfortably around their table, arrayed in their bright uniforms, with their own arms and their own legs unfettered, must have felt at least a faint flush of mingled pity, shame, and indignation as they looked across that room at that ironed row of human beings. Culprits arraigned before them, guarded by armed soldiery without arms themselves, why in the name of justice drag them into court and force them to sit through a long trial bound with iron hand and foot? Was it to forestall a last possible effort of reckless and suicidal despair? These brave warriors could not have feared the naked arm of pain, nor have indulged the childish apprehension that seven unarmed men and one unarmed woman might overpower six armed soldiers and nine gallant officers, and effect their escape from the third story of a prison guarded on all sides with bayonets and watched by detective police. And yet, so far as appears, no single member of the court to whom such a desecration of our common humanity was a daily sight for weeks thought it deserving of notice, much less of protest. There is but one explanation of this moral insensibility, and that applies with the same force to the case of the woman as to those of the men. It is that the accused were already doomed. For them no humiliation could be thought too deep, no indignity too vile, no hardship too severe, because their guilt was predetermined to be clear, and the members of the military commission, as they looked across the room at that sorry sight, saw nothing incongruous with justice, or even with the most chivalrous decorum, that the traitorous murderers of their beloved commander-in-chief should wear the chackles, which were the proper precursors of the death of ignominy, they were resolved the outlaws should not escape. We, civilians, must ever humbly bear in mind that the rule of the common law, that every person accused of crime is presumed to be innocent until his guilt is established beyond a reasonable doubt, a rule the benignity of which is often sneered at by soldiers as giving occasion for lawyers' tricks and quibbles, and as an impediment to swift justice, is reversed in military courts where every person accused of crime is presumed to be guilty until he himself prove his innocence. After the prisoners had been seated, and the members of the commission, the judge advocates, and the official reporters sworn in, the accused were severally arraigned. There was but one charge against the whole eight. Carefully formulated by the three judge advocates upon the lines of the theory adopted by the Secretary of War, and which General Baker and the Bureau of Military Justice had been moving heaven and earth to establish, it was so contrived as to allege a crime of such unprecedented, far-reaching, and profound heinousness as to be an adequate cause for such an unprecedented and profound calamity. The eight prisoners were jointly and severally charged with nothing less than having, in aid of the rebellion, traitorously conspired, together with one John H. Surratt, John Wilkes Booth, Jefferson Davis, George N. Sanders, Beverly Tucker, Jacob Thompson, William C. Cleary, Clement C. Clay, George Harper, George Young, and others unknown, to kill and murder Abraham Lincoln, late President of the United States and Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy thereof, Andrew Johnson, then Vice President, William H. Seward, Secretary of State, and Ulysses S. Grant, Lieutenant General, and of having, in pursuance of such traitorous conspiracy, together with John Wilkes Booth and John H. Surratt, traitorously murdered Abraham Lincoln, traitorously assaulted with intent to kill William H. Seward, and lain in wait traitorously to murder Andrew Johnson and Ulysses S. Grant. On this elastic comprehensive charge, in which treason and murder were vaguely commingled, every one of the men, and Mary E. Surratt, were arraigned, pled not guilty, and were put upon trial. There is no doubt, by the way, that the Secretary of War would have been included as one of the contemplated victims, had not Edwin M. Stanton borne so prominent a part in the prosecution, and it was for this reason, and not because of any change in the evidence, that General Grant stood alone as the mark of O'Laughlin. 
To this single charge there was also but a single specification. This document alleged that the design of all these traitorous conspirators was to deprive the army and navy of their commander-in-chief and the armies of their commander to prevent a lawful election of president and vice-president and by such means to aid and comfort the rebellion and overthrow the constitution and laws. It then alleged the killing of Abraham Lincoln by Booth in the prosecution of the conspiracy and charged the murder to be an act of the prisoners as well as of Booth and John H. Surratt. It then alleged that Spangler, in furtherance of the conspiracy, aided Booth in obtaining entrance to the box of the theatre, in barring the door of the theatre box, and in effecting his escape. Then that Harold, in furtherance of the conspiracy, aided and abetted Booth in the murder and in effecting his escape. Then that Payne, in like furtherance, made the murderous assault on Seward, and also on his two sons and two attendants. Then, that Atzerott, in like furtherance, at the same hour of the night, lay in wait for Andrew Johnson with intent to kill him. Then, that Michael O'Laughlin, in like furtherance, on the nights of the 13th and 14th of April, lay in wait for General Grant with like intent. Then, that Samuel Arnold, in prosecution of the conspiracy, did, on or before the 6th day of March, 1865, and on divers other days and times between that day and the 15th of April, 1865, combine, conspire with, and counsel, abet, comfort, and support Booth, Payne, Atzerodt, O'Laughlin, and their confederates. Then, that in prosecution of the conspiracy, Mary E. Surratt, on or before the 6th of March, 1865, and on divers other days and times between that day and the 20th of April, 1865, received, entertained, harbored, and concealed, aided, and assisted Booth, Harold, Payne, John H. Surratt, O'Laughlin, Atzerodt, Arnold, and their confederates, with the knowledge of the murderous and traitorous conspiracy aforesaid, and with intent to aid, abet, and assist them in the execution thereof, and in escaping from justice. And, lastly, that in prosecution of the conspiracy, Samuel A. Mudd did from on or before the 6th day of March to the 20th of April, advise, encourage, receive, entertain, harbor, and conceal, aid, and assist Booth, Harold, Payne, John H. Surratt, O'Laughlin, Atzerodt, Mary E. Surratt, Arnold, and their confederates in its execution and their escape. After the prisoners, who as yet had no counsel, had pleaded not guilty to the charge and specification, the court adopted rules of proceeding, one of which was that the sessions of the court should be secret, and no one but the sworn officers and the counsel for the prisoners, also sworn to secrecy, should be admitted, except by permit of the president of the commission, and that only such portions of the testimony as the judge advocate should designate should be made public. On the next day... Thursday, May 11th, Mr. Thomas Ewing, Jr., and Mr. Frederick Stone appeared as counsel for Dr. Mudd, and Mr. Frederick A. Aiken, and Mr. John W. Clampett for Mrs. Surratt. And on the succeeding day, 12th, Mr. Frederick Stone appeared for Harold at the earnest request of his widowed mother and estimable sisters. General Ewing for Arnold, and on Monday the 15th for Spangler, Mr. Walter S. Cox for O'Laughlin, and Mr. William E. Doster for Payne and Atzerodt. By the rules of the commission, no counsel could appear for the prisoners unless he took the ironclad oath or filed evidence of having taken it. So supersensitive was the loyalty of the court that it could not brook the presence of a sympathizer with the South, even in such a confidential relation as counsel for accused conspirators in aid of the rebellion. The demeanor of the court toward the counsel for the defense, reflecting as in a mirror the humor of the judge advocates, was highly characteristic. Sometimes they were treated with haughty indifference, sometimes with ironical condescension, often with contumely, generally with contempt. Their objections were invariably overruled, unless acceded to by the judge advocate. The commission could not conceal its secret opinion that they were engaged in a disreputable and disloyal employment. This statement must be somewhat qualified, however, so far as it relates to General Ewing. He was, or had been recently, of equal rank in the Army of the Union with the members of the court. 
He was a brother-in-law of General Sherman, and he had acquired a high reputation for gallantry and skill, as well as loyalty, during the war. That such a distinguished fellow-soldier should appear to defend the fiendish murderers of their beloved commander-in-chief, outlaws they were detailed as a court to hang, evidently perplexed and disconcerted these military judges, and tended in some degree to curb the overbearing insolence of the special judge advocate. Thus this able lawyer and gallant officer and noble man was enabled to be the leading spirit of the defense, and as we shall see he wrought a miracle of plucking from the deadly clutches of the judge advocates the lives of every one of the men he defended. But this instance was a most notable exception. As a rule, even the silent presence of the counsel for the accused jarred upon the feelings of the court, and their vocal interference provoked, at intervals, its outspoken animadversion. A trifling incident will serve to illustrate. The witnesses, while giving their testimony, were required to face the court, so that they necessarily turned their backs on the counsel for the prisoners who were placed some distance behind the witness stand. These counsel were also forced to cross-examine the witnesses for the prosecution and interrogate their own without seeing their faces, and as often as a witness in instinctive obedience to the dictates of good manners would turn round to answer a question, the president of the court would check him by a sharp reprimand and the stern admonition, face the court. The confusion of a witness, especially for the defense, when thundered at in this way by General Hunter, and the reiterated humiliation of counsel implied in the order, seems to have only called forth the wonder that witnesses would persist in turning toward the prisoner's counsel. Clearly these lawyers were an unmeaning and impeding and offensive, though unavoidable, superfluity. End of chapter 1「The Judicial Murder of Mary E. Surratt » by David Miller De Witt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Part I. The Murder. Chapter II. Animus of the Judges. On Saturday, the 13th of May, an incident occurred which throws much light upon the judicial temper of the court at the very beginning of the trial. On that day, Reverdy Johnson appeared as counsel for Mrs. Surratt. Admitted to the bar in 1815, Senator of the United States as far back as 1845, Attorney General of the United States as long ago as 1849, and holding the position of Senator of the United States again at that very moment, having taken the constitutional oath in all the courts, including the Supreme Court of the United States, at whose bar he was one of the most eminent advocates, three years after this time to be Minister Plenipotentiary to England, as he stood there, venerable both in years and in honors, appearing at great personal and professional sacrifice, gratuitously, for a woman in peril of her life, one would have thought him secure at least from insult. Yet no sooner did he announce his intention, if the court would permit him at any time to attend to his imperative duties elsewhere, to act as counsel, than the president of the commission read aloud a note he had received from one of his colleagues objecting, quote, to the admission of Reverdy Johnson as a counsel before this court on the ground that he does not recognize the moral obligation of an oath that is designed as a test of loyalty, end quote. And in support of the objection, referring to Mr. Johnson's letter to the people of Maryland pending the adoption of the new constitution in 1864, the following colloquy then took place. Mr. Johnson, may I ask who the member of the court is that makes the objection? The President, yes, sir, it is General Harris, and if he had not made it, I should have made it myself. Mr. Johnson, I do not object to it at all. The court will decide if I am to be tried. The President, the court will be cleared. Mr. Johnson, I hope I shall be heard. General Ekin, I think it can be decided without clearing the court. General Wallace, I move that Mr. Johnson be heard. The President and others, certainly. Mr. Johnson, is the opinion here to which the objection refers? The President, I think it is not. It was discovered further on that General Harris, by his own admissions, had not even seen the opinion since he had read it a year ago and that his objection, involving so grave an attack upon the moral character of so distinguished a man, 
was based upon a mere recollection of its contents after the lapse of time. Naturally, the gray-haired statesman and lawyer was indignant at this premeditated insult. In his address to the court, he repudiated with scorn the interpretation put upon his letter by the accuser. He explained the circumstances under which the opinion was delivered, that the Maryland Convention had prescribed an oath to the voter which they had no right to exact, quote, and all that the opinion said or was intended to say was that to take the oath voluntarily was not a craven submission to usurped authority, but was necessary in order to enable the citizen to protect his rights under the then Constitution, and that there was no moral harm in taking an oath which the Convention had no authority to impose. End quote. Among other things, he said, quote, There is no member of this court, including the President and the members, that objects who recognizes the obligation of an oath more absolutely than I do. And there is nothing in my life, from its commencement to the present time, which would induce me for a moment to avoid a comparison in all moral respects between myself and any member of this court. If such an objection was made in the Senate of the United States, where I am known, I forbear to say how it would be treated. I have lived too long, gone through too many trials, rendered the country such services as my abilities enabled me, and the confidence of the people in whose midst I am has given me the opportunity to tolerate for a moment, come from whom it may, such an aspersion upon my moral character. I am glad it is made now, when I have arrived at that period of life when it would be unfit to notice it in any other way. I am here at the instance of that lady, pointing to Mrs. Surratt, whom I never saw until yesterday, and never heard of, she being a Maryland lady, and thinking that I could be of service to her, and protesting, as she has done her innocence to me, of the facts I know nothing, because I deemed it right. I deemed it due to the character of the profession to which I belong, and which is not inferior to the noble profession of which you are members, that she should not go undefended. I knew I was to do it voluntarily, without compensation. The law prohibits me from receiving compensation. But if it did not, understanding her condition, I should never have dreamed of refusing upon the ground of her inability to make compensation. End quote. General Harris, in reply, insisted that the remarks of Mr. Johnson, explanatory of the letter, corroborated his construction. Quote, I understand him to say that the doctrine which he taught the people of his state was that because the convention had framed an oath which was unconstitutional and illegal in his opinion, therefore it had no moral binding force, and that people might take it and then go and vote without any regard to the subject matter of the oath. End quote. Mr. Johnson, interrupting, denied having said any such thing. General Hunter, thereupon, to help his colleague out, had the remarks read from the record. Mr. Johnson, assenting to the correctness of the report, General Harris continued, quote, If that language does not justify my conclusion, I confess I am unable to understand the English language, end quote, and then repeated his construction of the letter. After he had concluded, Mr. Johnson endeavored to show the author of Calvinism Vindicated that he did not understand the English language by pointing out the distinction between stating, quote, there was no harm in taking an oath and telling the people of Maryland that there would be no harm in breaking it after it was taken, end quote. Again repelling the misconstruction attempted to be put upon his words, he proceeded to open a new line as follows, quote, but as a legal question, it is something new to me that the objection, if it were well-founded in fact, is well-founded in law. Who gives to the court the jurisdiction to decide upon the moral character of the counsel who may appear before them? Who makes them the arbiters of the public morality and professional morality? What authority have they, under their commission, to rule me out, or to rule any other counsel out, upon the ground, above all, that he does not recognize the validity of an oath even if they believed it, end quote. General Harris, in rejoinder, stated that under the rules adopted by the commission, gentlemen appearing as counsel for the accused must either produce a certificate of having taken the oath of loyalty or take it before the court, and that therefore the court had a right to inquire whether the counsel held such opinions as to be incompetent to take the oath. He then expressed his gladness, quote, 
to give the gentleman the benefit of his disclaimer. It is satisfactory to me, but it is, I must insist, a tacit admission that there was some ground for the view upon which my objection was founded. End quote. Mr. Johnson closed this irritating discussion by saying, quote, The order under which you are assembled gives you no authority to refuse me admission because you have no authority to administer the oath to me. I have taken the oath in the Senate of the United States, the very oath that you are administering. I have taken it in the Circuit Court of the United States, I have taken it in the Supreme Court of the United States, and I am a practitioner in all the courts of the United States, in nearly all the states, and it would be a little singular if one who has a right to appear before the Supreme Judicial Tribunal of the land, and who has a right to appear before one of the legislative departments of the government, whose law creates armies and creates judges and courts-martial, should not have a right to appear before a court-martial. I have said all that I proposed to say. End quote. The president of the court, who had already made himself a party to this gross insult to a distinguished counsel, as if disappointed that the affair was about to end so smoothly, here burst out, quote, Mr. Johnson has made an intimation in regard to holding members of this court personally responsible for their action. Mr. Johnson, I made no such intimation, did not intend it. The president, then I shall say nothing more, sir. Mr. Johnson, I had no idea of it. I said I was too old to feel such things, if I even would. The President, I was going to say that I hoped the day had passed when free men from the North were to be bullied and insulted by the humbug chivalry, and that for my own part I hold myself personally responsible for everything I do here. The court will be cleared. End quote. On reopening, the judge advocate read a paper from General Harris withdrawing his objection because of Mr. Johnson's disclaimer. General Wallace remarked that it must be known to every member of the commission that Mr. Senator Johnson had taken the oath in the Senate of the United States. He therefore suggested that the requirement of his taking the oath be dispensed with. The suggestion was acquiesced in nem con. Mr. Johnson. I appear then as counsel for Mrs. Surratt. In reviewing, at this distance of time, the foregoing scene, it is scarcely possible to realize the state of mind of a member of a tribunal claiming at least to be a court of justice that could uh, prompt such an onslaught, so shocking to the universal expectation of dignity and decorum, not to say absolute impartiality, in a judge. The interpretation put upon the letter of Reverdy Johnson to his constituents by Generals Harris and Hunter was the ordinary, ill-considered, second-hand version circulated by blind party hostility. This is clearly shown by the fact that the objection of General Harris was not founded upon a recent perusal of the letter, but upon his own recollection of the impression it made in his own party circles the year before. When on the next Wednesday General Harris, having in the meantime looked it up, presented a copy of the incriminated opinion, prefacing a request that it be made a part of the record by the sneering remark that, quote, the honorable gentleman ought to be very thankful to me for having made an occasion for him to disclaim before the country any obliquity of intention in writing that letter, unquote. And on the suggestion of General Hunter, the letter was read. Every fair-minded man ought to have been convinced that it was open to such a malign misconstruction only by an unscrupulous political enemy. But suppose for a moment that their own hasty and uncharitable construction was correct. What right, what color of justification, did that give these two military judges to make that letter of the year before the pretext for a sudden attack in open court upon such a man as Reverdy Johnson, and on the consecrated occasion of his appearing as counsel for a lady on trial for her life? As to General Harris's argument that the requirement of an oath gave the Commission a right to inquire whether the written opinion of a counsel chosen for a defendant, previously delivered as a party leader, were of such a character as to render him incompetent to take an oath which the Supreme Court of the United States and the Senate of the United States had recognized his competency to take. Why, it is charitable to suppose and his subsequent claim would have been scouted as preposterous in any law court in the world. With regard to General Hunter, his ferocious personal defiance, hurled from the very bench, demonstrated in a flash his preeminent unfitness for any function that is judicial, even in a military sense. It is manifest that this whole attack, whether concerted or not, 
was not made from any conscientious regard for the sanctity of an oath, nor from any sensitive fear that Reverdy Johnson, as an oath-breaker, might contaminate the tribunal, but it was either a mere empty ebullition of party spleen, or of party hatred toward a distinguished Democrat, or it was made with a deliberate design to rob a poor woman of any probable advantage such eminent counsel might procure for her and whether the latter terrible suspicion be well founded or not true it is that this cruel result notwithstanding the withdrawal of the objection did not fail of full accomplishment reverdy johnson though suffered to appear as counsel was virtually out of the case he was present only at rare intervals during the trial and sent in his final argument to be read by one of his juniors the court had put its brand upon him and to any subsequent effort of his it turned an indifferent countenance and a deaf ear. He, forsooth, had sympathized with the rebellion, and that was enough. His appearance worked only harm to his client, if harm could be done to one whom the court believed to have been also a sympathizer with rebellion, and who was already doomed to suffer in the place of her uncaptured son. Another incident, occurring after the testimony on behalf of the prisoners had begun, will illustrate still more clearly, if possible, the mental attitude of the court. Among the witnesses sworn on the first day of the trial in secret session was one von Steinecker, who, according to his own statement, had been in the Confederate Army on the staff of Major General Edward Johnson. He told the usual cock-and-bull story about seeing Booth in Virginia in 1863, consorting with the rebel officers and concocting the assassination of Lincoln. At the time of his examination he was a prisoner of war, but after he had given his testimony he was discharged. The counsel for the defense, knowing nothing of the witness, did not cross-examine him at all. But subsequently they discovered that, uh, after having once been convicted of an attempt to desert, he had at last succeeded in deserting the Union Army, and had entered the service of the Confederates, that he had been convicted of theft by a court-martial, and that his whole story was a fiction. Thereupon, as soon as possible, the counsel for Mrs. Surratt applied for the recall of the witness for cross-examination, so as to lay the basis for his contradiction and impeachment, and they embodied the facts they were ready to prove in a paper which was signed by Reverdy Johnson and the other counsel for Mrs. Surratt. This application seems to have strangely disturbed the judge advocates and aroused the ire of the court. The prosecuting officers professed to have no knowledge of the whereabouts of the witness, and General Wallace, moved from his wanted propriety, delivered himself as follows, quote, I, for my part, object to the appearance of any such paper on the record, and wish to say now I understand distinctly and hold in supreme contempt such practices as this. It is very discreditable to the parties concerned, to the attorneys, and, if permitted, in my judgment, will be discreditable to the court. End quote. Mr. Clampett, with the most obsequious deference to the court, deprecated any such reflection upon the conduct of counsel and alluded to their duty to their unfortunate clients. But this humble apology was declared not satisfactory to the general or to the court, and the application was not only refused, but the paper was not allowed to go upon the record. However, this summary method of keeping facts out of sight availed nothing. Mrs. Surratt's counsel had cause to be summoned as a witness to contradict and impeach von Steinecker, Edward Johnson, the very major general on whose staff the witness had sworn he had been. General Johnson, a distinguished officer in the Confederate Army, was taken prisoner in 1864 and had been in confinement since, as such, at Fort Warren. From thence he had been brought to attend before the commission in obedience to a subpoena issued by the court. On the 30th of May he was called as a witness and appeared upon the stand to be sworn. As he stood there in his faded uniform, bearing doubtless traces of the six months' imprisonment from which he had come at the command of the court, facing the officers of the army he had so often encountered, and with his back turned upon the woman on whose behalf he had been summoned, General Albion P. Howe deemed it his duty as an impartial judge to make the following attack upon him. After stating it was well known that, quote, the person, unquote, before the court had been educated at the National Military Academy, and had since for many years held a commission in the U.S. Army, and had therefore taken the oath of allegiance, 
this gallant officer and upright judge proceeded quote, in 1861 it became my duty as an officer to fire upon a rebel party of which this man was a member and that party fired upon struck down and killed loyal men who were in the service of the government i understand that he is brought here now as a witness to testify before this court and he comes here as a witness with his hands red with the blood of his loyal countrymen shed by him or by his assistance in violation of his solemn oath as a man and his faith as an officer i submit to this court that he stands in the eye of the law as an incompetent witness because he is notoriously infamous to offer as a witness a man who stands with this character who has openly violated the obligations of his oath and his faith as an officer and to administer the oath to him and present his testimony is but an insult to the court and an outrage upon the administration of justice i move that this man edward johnson be ejected from the court as an incompetent witness on account of his notorious infamy on the grounds i have stated End quote. general eakin welcomed the opportunity to distinguish himself by seconding the motion and characterizing the appearance of the witness before the commission quote, with such a character as quote, the height of impertinence Unquote. in his haste to insult a fallen foe he seems to have forgotten that the witness had no alternative but to come counsel for the prisoner humbly reminded the court that the prosecution itself had sworn as its own witnesses men who had borne arms against the government the judge advocate saw that the members of the court had gone too far and after calling their attention to the familiar rule that the record of conviction in a judicial proceeding was the only basis of a total rejection of a witness proceeded to provide a channel for the relief of the court by suggesting that they could discredit the witness upon the ground stated although they could not declare him incompetent to testify the assertion is confidently made that in the whole annals of english criminal jurisprudence full as they are of instances of the grossest unfairness to persons on trial no such outrage upon the administration of justice as the foregoing can be found to find its parallel you must go to the records of the french revolutionary tribunal what are we to think of the complaint of a union general that a rebel party fired first no but that when it became its duty as an officer to fire upon a rebel party the rebel party fired back what in mars name did this warrior expect would he have had kinder feelings toward his brave adversary if in response to his own volley the confederate general had tamely laid down his arms or played the coward and ran nowadays when the blue and the gray meet charges of infamy are no longer heard but the more deadly the past warfare the greater the reciprocal respect however this unprovoked assault upon an unoffending officer powerless to repel it although it did not result in his ejection from the court, effectually disposed of General Johnson as a witness. In answer to the questions of counsel, he calmly gave his testimony, which exploded both von Steinecker and his story. Judge Bingham confined his cross-examination to eliciting the facts that the witness had graduated from West Point, served in the U.S. Army until 1861, resigned, and joined the Confederate Army. The court paid no attention to his direct testimony because he had fired upon Union men when they had fired upon him. The foregoing incidents conclusively show, were any such demonstration necessary, that a board of nine military officers, fresh from service in the field in a bloody civil war, with all the fierce prejudices naturally bred by such a conflict hot within their bosoms, was the most unfit tribunal possible to administer impartial justice to eight persons charged with the murder of the commander-in-chief of the army to which every member of the court belonged committed in aid of that rebellion which during four years of hard fighting they had helped to suppress end of chapter two The Judicial Murder of Mary E. Surratt by David Miller DeWitt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Part One: The Murder. Chapter Three: The Conduct of the Trial. The whole conduct of the trial emphasizes this conclusion. The court, 
in weighing the evidence, adopted and acted upon the following proposition, that any witness sworn for any of the prisoners who had enlisted in the Confederate service, or had at any time expressed secession sentiments, or sympathized in any way with the South, was totally unworthy of credit. The court went a step farther, and adopted the monstrous rule that participation in the rebellion was evidence of participation in the assassination. This assertion now seems incredible, but it is fully attested by the record. At one stage of the trial the judge advocate asked a witness whether or not the prisoner Arnold had been in the military service of the rebels. General Ewing, his counsel, strenuously objected to this question on the ground that it tended to prove the prisoner guilty of another crime than the one for which he was on trial, and thus to prejudice him in the eyes of the court. Judge Holt remarked, quote, how kindred to each other are the crimes of treason against a nation and assassination of its chief magistrate. The murder of the president was preeminently a political assassination. When, therefore, we shall show on the part of the accused acts of intense disloyalty bearing arms in the field against the government, we show with him the presence of an animus toward the government which relieves this accusation of much, if not all, of its improbability. Unquote. He asserted that such a course of proof was constantly resorted to in criminal courts, and when General Ewing challenged him, as well he might, to produce any authorities for such a position, he called upon the indomitable Bingham to state them. The special judge advocate responded, but he courteously but unmistakably shied away from his colleague's position, and put the competency of the testimony upon another ground, viz., that where the intent with which a thing was done is in issue, other acts of the prisoner which tend to prove the intent may be given in evidence. Here he was dealing with a familiar principle, and could cite any number of cases. He then proceeded to apply his good law. How? By claiming that conspiracy to murder having been laid in the charge, quote, with the intent to aid the rebellion, unquote, that was the intent in issue here, and therefore to prove that a man was in the rebellion went to prove that intent. At the request of General Ewing, he read the allegation which ran, in aid of the rebellion and not with intent to aid, and the counsel pointed out that there was an allegation of fact and not of intent, but the judge insisted that it was in effect an allegation of intent, implied if not expressed. General Ewing then replied to his adversary's argument by showing that such an allegation was an unnecessary allegation. Conspiracy to murder and attempted murder were crimes done with intent to kill, and it was a matter of no moment in pleading to allege a general intent to aid the rebellion. Courts had no right to violate the laws of evidence because the prosecution had seen fit to violate the laws of pleading. Judge Bingham contended, and cited authorities, for his familiar law, and then again, in applying it triumphantly, asked, when he, Arnold, entered it, i.e. the rebellion, he entered in it to aid it, did he not? Mr. Ewing. He did not enter into that to assassinate the President. At this, the assistant judge advocate, rising to the decisive and culminating point of his argument, gave utterance to the following proposition. Quote, yes, he entered into it to assassinate the President, and everybody else that entered into the rebellion entered into it to assassinate everybody that represented the government, that either followed the standard in the field, or represented its standard in the councils. That is exactly why it is germane. End quote. And thereupon the commission immediately overruled the objection. General Ewing told the exact truth, without a particle of rhetorical exaggeration, when in the closing sentence of his argument against the jurisdiction of the commission he exclaimed, quote, Indeed, the position taken by the learned assistant judge advocate goes to this, and even beyond it namely, that participation in the rebellion was participation in the assassination, and that the rebellion itself formed part of the conspiracy for which these men are on trial here. Unquote. Throughout the whole trial, the commission took the law from the judge advocates with the unquestioning docility usually manifested by a jury on such matters in civil courts. In truth, the main function of the judge advocate appears to be to furnish law to the court, as in civil courts the main function of the judge is to furnish law to the jury. Consequently, his exposition of the law on any disputed point, whether relative to modes of procedure or to the competency of testimony, 
or even to questions of jurisdiction. Instead of standing on the same level with the antagonistic exposition of counsel for the accused as an argument to be weighed by the court against its opposite in the equal scales of decision, was at all times authoritative, like the opinion of a judge overruling the contention of a lawyer. This, surely, was bad enough for a defendant, but what was still more fatal to his chances of fair dealing, this habit of domination, acquiesced in by the court on questions of law, had the effect, as is also seen in civil courts, of giving the same superior force to the expositions of questions of fact by the judge advocate. And as this office combined the functions of a prosecuting officer with the functions of a judge, there could be no restraints of law, custom, or personal delicacy against the enforcement, with all the powers of reasoning and appeal at command, the conclusion of the judge advocate upon the matters of fact. In a word, the judgment of the prosecuting officer, the retained counsel for the government, the plaintiff in the action, ruled with absolute sway, both on the law and on the facts, the judgment of the commission, the members of which, for that matter, were also in the pay of the government. It may, therefore, be readily anticipated with how little impartiality the trial was conducted. Mrs. Surratt, as did the rest of the accused, pled to the jurisdiction of the commission on the grounds, one, that she was not and had not been in the military service of the United States, and two, that when the crimes charged were committed, the civil courts were open in Washington, both of which allegations were admitted and were notoriously true. Whatever might be the indifference with which the rights of the men to a constitutional trial may have been viewed, it was so utterly incongruous with the spirit of military jurisprudence and so unprecedented in practice to try a woman by court-martial, that had Mrs. Surratt been alone before that commission, we venture to say those nine soldiers could not have brought themselves or allowed the judge advocate to bring them to the overruling of her plea. As it was, however, the courtroom was cleared of all save the members of the commission and the three judge advocates, and after a season of what is called deliberation, which meant the further enforcement of the opinion of the prosecuting officers upon the point under discussion, where necessary, the court reopened, and the judge advocate announced that the pleas had been overruled by the commission. Mrs. Surratt, as did the other prisoners, then asked for a separate trial, a right guaranteed to her in all the civil courts of the vicinage. It was denied to her, without discussion, as a matter of course and yet no one now can fail to recognize the grievous disadvantage under which this one woman labored, coupled in a single trial with such culprits as Payne, who had confessed his guilt, and Harold, who was captured with Booth. In fact, the scheme of trial contrived by the judge advocates on a scale comprehensive enough to embrace the prisoners, the Canadian exiles, and the Confederate cabinet, would not work on a trial of Mrs. Surratt alone. Of this pet plan they were highly proud and greatly enamored, to it, everything, the rights of woman as well as man, considerations of equity and common fairness, must be made to give way. To the maintenance of this scheme in its integrity they had marshaled the witnesses, and they guided the commission with a firm hand so that not a jot or tittle of its symmetry should be marred. This determined purpose is indicated by the starting point they chose for the testimony. On Friday the 12th, the first witness was sworn, and his name was Richard Montgomery. His testimony, as well as that of the other witnesses sworn that day, was taken in secret session, and no portion of it was allowed to reach the public until long after the trial. It was all directed to establish the complicity of the rebel agents in Canada, and through them the complicity of Jefferson Davis and other officers of the Confederacy in the assassination. In other words, this testimony was given to prove the guilt not of the men, much less of the woman, on trial, but of the men included in the charge, but not on trial, and whom it now appears the United States never intended to try. To connect the defunct Confederacy in the person of its captive chief with the murder of the President would throw a halo of romantic wickedness about the crime, and chime in with the prevalent hatred toward every human being in any way connected with the rebellion. This class of testimony continued to be introduced every now and then during the trial, whenever most convenient to the prosecution, and as often as it was given the courtroom was cleared of spectators and the session secret, 
the isolated counsel for mrs surratt utterly at a loss to imagine the connection of such testimony given under such solemn precautions with their own client and knowing nothing whatever of the witnesses themselves must have looked on in bewildered amazement and had no motive for cross-examination the chief witnesses who gave this carefully suppressed evidence were spies upon the rebel agents in canada paid by the united states and at the same time spies upon the united states paid by the rebel agents they were of course ready to swear to as many conversations with these agents both before and after the assassination in which those agents implicated themselves and the heads of government at richmond in the most reckless manner as the judge advocates thought necessary or advisable the head parent and tutor of this band of witnesses was a man called sanford conover after giving his testimony before the commission he went to canada and again resumed his simulated intimacy with the confederates there passing under the name of james w wallace an unauthorized version of his testimony having leaked out and appearing in the newspapers he was called to account for it by his canadian friends he then made and published an affidavit that the person who had given testimony before the commission was not himself but an impostor and at the same time also published an offer of five hundred dollars reward for the arrest of the infamous and perjured scoundrel who secretly personated me under name of sanford conover and deposed to a tissue of falsehood before the military commission at washington being reclaimed by the government from his canadian perils he appeared again before the court after the testimony had been closed and the summing up of all the prisoners counsel had been completed june twenty seventh when he testified that his affidavit had been extorted from him by the confederates in canada by threats of death at the point of a pistol this man conover was subsequently in eighteen sixty seven tried and convicted of perjury and sent to the penitentiary and with him the whole structure of perjured testimony fabricated for reward by him and montgomery and their co-spies fell to the ground secretary seward testified before the judiciary committee of the house of representatives in eighteen sixty seven that quote, the testimony of these witnesses was discredited and destroyed by transactions in which sanford conover appeared and the evidence of the alleged complicity of jefferson davis thereupon failed end quote but at the period of the trial when the passionate desire for vengeance was at its height any plausible scoundrel whose livelihood depended on the rewards for wholesale perjury and who was sure to be attracted to washington by the scent of his favorite game was thrice welcomed to the bureau of military justice any story no matter how absurd or incredible provided it brought jefferson davis within conjectural foreknowledge of the assassination was greedily swallowed and moreover was rewarded with money and employment these harpies flocked like buzzards around the doors of the old penitentiary and all black and white from richmond from washington and from montreal were eager for a consideration to swear that davis and benjamin were the instigators of booth and surratt and such testimony as it was for the most part the sheerest hearsay the private impressions of the witness in one instance his recollection of the contents of a letter the witness had heard read or talked about the signature of which although he did not see it himself he heard was the signature of jefferson davis testimony wholly inadmissible under the most elementary rules of evidence but swept before the commission in the absence of counsel for the parties implicated and under the immunity of a secret session for example a blind man who had been at an undated period during the war a hanger-on around the camp at richmond being asked whether he had heard any conversations among the rebel officers in regard to the contemplated assassination answered quote, in a general way i have heard sums offered to be paid with a confederate sum for any person or persons to go north and assassinate the president End quote being pressed to name the amount and by what officers he answered at this moment i cannot tell you the particular names of shoulder straps etc question do you remember any occasion some dinner occasion answer i can tell you this i heard a citizen make the remark once that he would give from his private purse ten thousand dollars 
in addition to the Confederate amount, to have the President assassinated, to bring him to Richmond dead or alive for proof. Question. I understood you to say that it was a subject of general conversation among the rebel officers. Answer. It was. The rebel officers, as they would be sitting around their tent doors, would be conversing on such a subject a great deal. They would be saying they would like to see his head brought there, dead or alive, and they should think it could be done, and I have heard such things stated as that they had certain persons undertaking it. In the introduction of evidence against Mrs. Surratt, as well as the others on trial, the judge advocates allowed themselves the most unlimited range. Narrations of all sorts of events connected with the progress of the war, historical, problematical, or fabulous, having no relevancy to the particular charge against her or them, but deadly in their tendency to steal the minds of the court against her, were admitted without scruple or hesitation. Seven soldiers who had been prisoners of war at Libby Prison, Bell Island, or Andersonville were called, and testified in all its ghastly details to the terrible treatment they and their fellow prisoners had undergone. Three witnesses were sworn to prove that the rebel government buried a torpedo under the center of Libby Prison to be fired if the U.S. troops entered Richmond. Letters found in the Richmond archives were read, offering to rid the world of the Confederacy's deadliest enemies and projecting wholesale destruction to property in the North. Testimony was allowed to be given of the burning of U.S. transports and bridges by men in the Confederate service, of the raids from Canada into the United States, of the alleged plot in all its horrible features to introduce the yellow fever into northern cities by infecting clothing, testified to by the villain who swore he did it for money. It is scarcely to be credited, yet it is a fact, that the confession of Robert Kennedy, hung in March previous for attempting to burn the city of New York, was read in evidence, as was also a letter from a Confederate soldier, detailing the blowing up of vessels by a torpedo and the killing of Union men at City Point, endorsed by a recommendation of the operator to favor. On June 27th, after the testimony had been closed and the summing up of counsel for the defense ended, the case was reopened, and there was introduced an advertisement clipped from the Selma Dispatch of December 1st, 1864, wherein some anonymous lunatic offered, if furnished one million dollars, to cause the lives of Lincoln, Seward, and Johnson to be taken before the 1st of March. The prosecution closed its direct testimony on May 25th, reserving the right, of which we have seen they availed themselves from time to time, thereafter to call further witnesses on the character of the rebellion and the complicity of its leaders in the assassination. Out of about 150 witnesses, 66 gave testimony of that kind. Of the remaining 84, about 50 testified to the circumstances attending the assassination, the pursuit and capture of Booth and Herald, and the terrific assault of Payne on William H. Seward and his household. Of the remaining thirty-four, there were nine whose testimony was directed to the incrimination of Mrs. Surratt. The important witnesses against her were three soldiers testifying under the eye of their superior officers as to her non-recognition of Payne, and two informers who had turned state's evidence to save their own necks who connected her with Booth. The witnesses for the defense, for the most part, were treated by the special judge advocate as virtual accomplices of the accused, and as soon as by a searching cross-examination he had extorted from them a reluctant admission of the slightest sympathy with the South, as in almost every case he was able to do, he swept them aside as impeached, and their testimony as unworthy of a moment's consideration. A former slave, who announced himself or herself as ready to give evidence against his or her former master, was a delicious morsel for the Bureau of Military Justice, and several such were sworn for the prosecution, while, on the other hand, nothing so exasperated the loyal Bingham, or so astonished the court, as the apparition of an old slave woman summoned by the defense, eagerly endeavoring to exculpate her former master. Several priests testified as to the good character of Mrs. Surratt as a lady and a Christian, but the effect of their testimony was immediately demolished in the eyes of the court, when on cross-examination, although they refused to substantiate what the judge advocate called her notorious intense disloyalty, they could not remember 
that they had ever heard her utter one loyal sentiment. End of chapter 3